Hello, and welcome to The Art of Being Human. We've been working on the defense mechanisms, coping mechanisms, adjustment mechanisms, however you want to call it. And I think it's really important because this is the way that you handle stress, and this is the way that you handle life. And so I've been taking my time going through them. There are about 10 of them. We've gone over about six of them, and everybody uses them. No one is exempt from it. You tend to use one or two or three maybe to the exclusion of some of the others. You don't use all of them, but there are some you use more predominantly than others. You don't make a choice. Your body, body kind of falls into it. So I want to do a quick review of the six that we have done and then possibly finish the rest of them this segment. Then after we finish them, however long it takes, it shouldn't take that much longer, I want to go into personality traits and what we know about personality and how people People judge personality and their theories of personality. But for now, let's have a quick review of the adjustment mechanisms that we have gone over so far. The first one is increased work and effort, and that is doing more work and working harder in order to handle your stress. The advantage of it is that it does take you away from your stress, at least for a while. The disadvantage of it is that you can become compulsive in your work, and it may be that you don't solve your problems because you're just so interested in working hard that you never face the problems that, that haunt you. And so therefore, it has both a healthy and unhealthy part. Most of these do, but some of them are more unhealthy or healthier than others. Then the second one that we did was compensation. In compensation, if you can't succeed in one thing, then you do another. Generally speaking, a very healthy response to stress. The only time that it would be unhealthy would be if you are overcompensating in which you insist on doing the things that you can't do. It's not that you say, I can't do this, so I'll do something else. It's that you insist on retrying and doing over and over the thing that you failed at. That would be overcompensation and that would be unhealthy because, as you know, not everybody is good at everything. And if there's something you can't do, then just embrace that. You know, sometimes failure helps you as much as success because it teaches you what you can and what you cannot do. So that was the second one. Then after that, we had rationalization. And that would be acceptable acceptable reasons for not being able to reach your goals, something that people would accept. Now, sometimes it sounds like an excuse, but if it's an excuse, then it's not true rationalization. It becomes rationalization when you really believe what it is that you're saying. The dog ate my homework. Uh, I didn't pass the test because the teacher hates me. It sounds like an excuse. It may well be an excuse, except if you truly believe Believe it, then you're rationalizing. This sounds, uh, it's, it's basically, I think I'd have to say it's basically unhealthy because what it does, it forces you or it gives you a break and you don't have to face the problem that caused you the failure, but at the same time, you don't tackle the problem either to find out what really is going on. And you tend to believe in something that's not true and you believe it is truth. And I think that may be the main danger of using it. Then we had attention-getting behavior. Attention-getting behavior is just doing things to get attention. For a lot of children, this becomes a, a, an issue, especially when, like, they have somebody else that's taking attention away from them, and so therefore they act in a different kind of way to get the attention of their parents. But adults do it too. People who dress differently or act differently behave differently simply because they want to have the attention attract to them instead of somebody else. And that, can, I think, can be pretty unhealthy because what happens is that you allow yourself not to be yourself for the sake of getting the attention of other people that maybe it's not healthy for you to do. So I don't think that it's particularly healthy as a, as a mechanism. Then we had identification as trying to be like somebody else. It can go from mild to bizarre. 
You know, if you want to be like somebody else and they're acting like a healthy role model for you, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think children need healthy role models to be like. They want to be like their daddy. They want to be like their mommy. And that's very, very healthy for human development. But when it gets to be really exaggerated is when you try to be exactly like somebody else. You try to dress like them. You try to talk like them. You style your hair like them. You use the same kind of makeup. You use the same kind of dress. And it's almost like you want to be a clone of the person that you're identified with. And that, when it gets to that point, it is unhealthy because you are not being you. You are trying to be somebody else. Now, uh, it goes way beyond the, the role model stage into something else. And, but you can identify with family members, with friends, with professional people, with people that you don't know but you've heard about or you've seen them on television, or even uh, people that are in history and they're no longer alive but you admire them for some reason. So identification is a broad spectrum. You can be identified with a lot of people. But if you're giving up the essence of yourself to be like somebody else because you admire somebody else so much that you basically want to be them, then you're giving up your own qualities to try to be like them. And first of all, it's not going to succeed because nobody's like anybody else. Like snowflakes, we're all different, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And, and so you don't know sometimes the other situations that the person you identify with might be involved with. You, they may have a darker side, or they may have something that you shouldn't want to identify with. But at any rate, identification, it's, it's OK to a point, but if you, if you overdo it, then it becomes unhealthy. Uh, uh, so let me see. Then I talked about uh, projection is when you put your uh, faults on other people. When you don't have the faults that you have, or you don't see the faults in yourself, but instead you see those faults in somebody else, then that is not good. Because what you do is not face up to the fact of your own faults. If somebody is selfish, or if the world seems selfish, you may be selfish, but you don't recognize it. You put your selfishness, and I'm only using this as an example, selfishness, or anger, or greed, or whatever it is, you put those characteristics on to other people and assume that's what they are like without admitting to the fact that that's what you are like and you may be misjudging somebody else. They may not have the characteristics that you're putting on them, but you've got them. But instead of acknowledging that and working on those characteristics, you make it appear as if somebody else has them instead. Now I think that's as far as we went, so I want to continue with the next one. And the next one that we have haven't gone into yet, but we will now. This is repression. Repression is forced forgetting. You forget things. Well, what kinds of things will you forget? Anything that's extremely painful. You know, I've heard so many people tell me, I, uh, I would never forget this. I would never forget molestation. I would never forget when I was injured because somebody attacked me. I would never forget that because it was so horrific that I would have to remember it. But the truth of the fact is, you tend to forget the most painful things. You probably don't remember the time that you were molested. You probably don't remember the time that, that somebody attacked you and you were injured. The reason being, it's so hard to face that because it's so horrific that you tend to push that down in your memory, except, especially if you're a child. Now, I'm not saying that you forget everything. If you're, if you're walking in the street and somebody comes and punches you out, you know, and you go to the hospital for medical treatment, it's not immediately going to go into your subconscious. But if it's something that happened to you as a child and you were molested or you were raped or something happened to you that was awful, by the time you're an adult, you've covered it up with so much other stuff that it tends to go down in your subconscious and you really don't remember it. And what happens in psychotherapy is the psychotherapist kind of unravels all of the layers that you've piled on top of it and brings it back up for you to remember. 
And a, a therapist has to be very careful to do that right, because you don't want a person to be re-traumatized, but you do, you do want them to remember enough so that they can deal with it and then move on. And of course, if you remember a lot and you remember it too soon and it was too traumatizing, you will be re-traumatized and it will cause you some mental health problems. So it's best to do it gradually and feel comfortable with a therapist, and then gradually, as time moves on, it kind of comes up by itself. The brain is a marvelous organ. It tends to hide those things which are very difficult to deal with. And then when the person is ready, when the human being is ready to accept and deal with those things that have been traumatic, they start to remember them. They come up on their own. But it takes a skilled therapist to do this, and I've seen it done well, but I've seen it done bad too so you have to be very careful but that's what repression is and um, it, it, it's important that you remember I'm not I'm not convinced that you have to remember everything I'm not convinced that you can remember everything although I know psycho psychoanalysts think that you can but the thing is if you remember enough to see a pattern if you had an abusive parent you might not remember everything that your parent did that was abusive but you remember enough to know that there's a pattern and when there's a pattern you deal with that pattern and then you get better from that you see so I think a gentle kind of therapy that takes its time, and this is one of the reasons that therapy does take time, because you don't want to traumatize people by making them remember too much too soon. But if it's not remembered, then you get all these queer little symptoms that you don't know where they're coming from. You know, you have the anxiety, you have the depression, you have symptoms that are really uncomfortable to deal with, and you're fearful, and you're angry, and you have outbursts, and you don't understand why you can't get a along with people and you have all kinds of these symptoms we say that it's actually coming out sideways because you've never dealt with the initial problem if you deal with the initial problem then there's a good chance that you're not going to have those other symptoms when you understand what you've been through and when you realize that 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 doesn't make you a bad person you don't have to feel bad about yourself you didn't cause it you didn't do anything wrong people took advantage of you as a child people hurt you as a child, uh, but, but you, it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong to deserve it. And when you can affirm the fact that you are a good, reasonable person in your own right with gifts and abilities, and the fact that somebody did something to you does not need to make you feel ashamed of yourself. There's no shame in admitting that somebody hurt you when you, when you were too young to defend yourself. There's no shame in that. You couldn't help it. You, weren't, you didn't have the power to stop it. A person hurt you who had more power than you. It's a power play of one person over another when a person is abusing another person. But it's not your fault and you didn't do anything wrong. So when you can embrace yourself as a valuable human being, no matter what happened to you, then you can face some things that maybe you weren't able to face before, and then you can get well. And when you get well, it doesn't mean that you're going to forget you've brought the memory back up so it doesn't mean that you're going to forget but what's going to happen is it doesn't have to haunt you yes this happened yes I have a memory of it but it doesn't make me feel down on myself it doesn't make me feel any less worth and I can recover to the point where it's there but I don't have to let it haunt me I just don't have to let it haunt me. And I can move on with my life. I can do things with my life, and I can be a normal person. So that's something for you to remember. It's very, very important in therapy that you uncover the things that are the things that you need to uncover. Your brain will do it for you. It'll help you to remember when you feel comfortable enough to remember it. And then you deal with it, and you can move on, and you can get well. And you'd be surprised what pe that people are resilient, and they recover from a lot of things. And if you don't deal with it, and you try to keep pushing it down and pushing it down because you don't want to remember it, then you're always going to have other symptoms that come up in its place. 
I tell people, you know, there's no such thing as a symptom without a cause. If you're having symptoms, anger management problems, or you're angry, or you're depressed, or you're anxious, whatever they are, there's a reason behind it because there's no such thing as a symptom without a cause. So when you find the cause and you bring it up and deal with it, all those other symptoms can go away. They can go away because you don't need them anymore. It takes a lot of energy to push down a symptom, to push down a cause of a symptom, and why not just remember it and deal with it? You're much better off. But as I said, it has to be done carefully, and the most painful memories are the ones that are repressed. This is what will be for forced forgetting. It is a natural human response for that to happen. So now I'm going to go to a couple of others that I have. Daydreaming. There's one I'm going to skip here. Daydreaming. Daydreaming is when you decide that you're going to take leave of your reality, whatever it is for the moment, and start thinking about something else. And the thing about daydreaming is that it's relaxing. You can daydream about anything that you want. People will tend to daydream on either uh, things that they don't have or uh, uh, rules that they had, or I'm trying to think of goals. This is what I'm trying to think of. When you don't reach your goals, you tend to daydream about what you don't have or the goals that you did not meet. And so it's like you met them, but you met them in your daydream life, but not in your real life. So you daydream a lot of times to meet the needs that have not been met in real life, but they're met in your daydream life. So it's almost like there's a split here, and it's almost like there's a two of you one of you which is the real you and the other of you which is living the life of a daydream when you're thinking about things and it's like you're not rich, you're poor, so you daydream that you're rich. Or you wish you had a new car, but you don't have a new car, you can't get a, a new car, so you daydream about the car. Now these are just simple, simple examples, but you tend to daydream to meet needs that you have not met in real life. Now, is this good or it's bad? Well, it depends upon how you use it and when you use it. It's okay to use it as like a brief kind of a vacation from what you're dealing with, but it's not good to use it to the point where you're living in your life of daydreams and you're not dealing with real life. People who daydream also tend to daydream about being a hero, uh, either a suffering hero where they get injured or hurt, but they still are the hero of the daydream. They save the life of somebody or whatever it happens to be. I'm just kind of making this up as I go along here, but that's what, that's what people daydream of. They're either a suffering hero or they're an unsuffering hero. A suffering hero means that they're doing, they have hurt themselves, but they're still a hero. The unsuffering hero is that they just are wonderful and they do whatever it is they want to do like a Superman, and they never get hurt by it. So you can almost categorize your daydreams. If you look at your daydreams, and maybe you'll do that, if you look at your daydreams, uh, see what they're about. See if you can categorize them. Because everybody daydreams some, but some people make a habit of daydreaming a lot. And what is it that you're daydreaming about if you're doing it a lot? Is it something that's going to uh, hurt you in the long run because it's taking you away from reality? Is it something that fe makes you feel like you've met a need and so you don't have to worry about meeting it in real life? Or something that you wish would happen that probably won't, so you're kind of fulfilling that wish in your daydreams. You can categorize your daydreams, and it only becomes a problem when you do it too much and it goes too far. Uh, daydreaming about some little thing here or there, that's not a problem, but making it a whole focus of your existence is a problem. Well, I have one more. I just have a few minutes left. Well, actually, I have two more. I don't know if I can get these two done or not, but regression when a person acts younger than they are, usually for the sake of getting attention. And it happens a lot in children when there's a new baby coming, they're about three years old, and there's another baby coming, and they want the attention that the new baby is getting when the baby comes. And so therefore, they start like acting like a baby themselves so that you know they will get more attention. You can deal with that. You can handle that 
all right. There are ways of handling that. But that's regression. And it does happen in adults, too, when they want to go back to an era of time when they felt safe and when they felt better than they do now. And so they go back, <coughs> excuse me, they go back in that era of time and act like they were like 20 years younger than they were. You know, they dress like they're much younger than they were. They act like they were much younger than they were. And it seems out of place, usually because it is out of place, because they're acting younger, because they're trying to recapture an era in time or an, a, a, a time period in their lives when they felt safe when they felt better, when they were younger, and so they try to go back to that. And so they try to be like that person that they used to be. The only other one that I want to go into is withdrawal. And this is very typical of mental illnesses. When a person withdraws, they stay away from reality. They're in their own little world. You would find that in some serious mental illnesses. And a lot of people who have problems with withdrawal end up by have to being treated some of them in mental hospitals because they're like in a different reality. You know, the thing about being mentally ill is that some people who are mentally ill cannot tell the difference between what is real and what is not real. And they develop this life of non-reality and they live in that life and they're out of contact with reality. They have no contact with reality. They're just in their own inner space. And sometimes it's a very painful space. Sometimes they think it's a better space. But if they're mentally ill, they can't live in normal society that way. So that's withdrawal. In a sense, it's a little bit like daydreaming, except they've created a whole other reality, and they stay there. And as a result of that, they can't mix it with normal society because they're not like normal society. So it's, it gets more complicated than this, but we've kind of run out of time. So therefore, I'm going to uh, close it here and we've done all of the uh, defense mechanisms and so next time we can start with something else so please join me then